Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May God bless this reading of his word. Amen. Amen. And he's trying to make a connection. We do the same thing. 
You know, you're from, oh, you're from the Cape? You know so-and-so in Yarmouth? Do you know so-and-so in Ionis? Do you know, you know, we make those kinds of connections. And that's what Paul is doing later on. But we're not here really to discuss that. We want to know what's going on with this passage of Scripture in verse 5. He had a heart for the people in the Roman church. And why? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because there were tensions. There were tensions between the, the Jewish people and there were tensions between the Gentiles. The Jews were very religious, very into the law. We do it this way, we do it that way. The Gentiles were much more liberal. They were extremely liberal and carefree, and the, the Jewish Christians were more uh, legalistic, if you want to use that word. And so Paul was trying to find a balance. That's one of the main reasons that he wrote this letter, to get people to, to come together, to find common ground and worship God without the tensions. We have that same kind of thing today. Some people are more religious than other people. I don't like, I, I got thrown out of a church in Roxbury because back then when I had a whole lot of hair, <laughs> I had my hair in braids and I wore a t-shirt and one of the deacons threw me out. We don't need your kind in here. Threw me out of the church because of the appearance, because of my appearance. I had blue jeans. I don't know. That, that was a crime, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, we, we, we have a tendency sometimes, no matter who we are, to judge other people. And we should not do that. That's what Paul was trying to get the church not to do. Amen. Amen. I think back in my, my own life, you know, we, 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 we judge people because they do this or they do that. Or there's a certain code of, of dress you have to abide by. Some people go to church in jeans. That's fine. Some people like to wear bow ties. That's fine. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the day when I can get Gary to wear a bow tie. <laughs> Amen. And, <laughs> but I thought about my grandmother, my, my dear grandmother. My grandmother would not have been caught dead in wearing a pair of pants. She never wore, that was just the the, 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 the culture of that day. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I really stop. I mean, today, everybody, anything goes, as Cole Porter would say. But I, I never even thought of my grandma just to show you just culture. And there are churches that say you shouldn't go to a movie or you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Or we do this and you don't. And Paul was trying to break all of that Put all of that aside and bring people to come together. Paul is saying head on that our salvation is not predicated on what we do, but it's rather that we are justified by faith in what Jesus Christ has already done on the cross for each and every one of us. And each one of us today were saved by God's grace. Grace is his unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't do anything to deserve the grace of God. We have been blessed with God's grace. It's his unmerited favor. It has nothing to do with what we do or don't do. It has to do with faith. Do you trust him? Do you really believe that he's real? Do you really believe? And he wants us to believe. And I'm sharing this from my heart. This is one of my favorite verses, and I share it passionately today because there's something to be said about that one verse, Romans 5.5. 5. I want your homework assignment is to memorize it this week. For God poured out his love, poured it out, poured it out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. That's not that hard to memorize. If I can memorize it, anybody can memorize it. Amen. For God poured out his love, poured out his love into our hearts 
by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. Praise God. That's the foundation of our faith. No matter what anybody else tells you, that's our foundation. It's trusting in Christ. And so therefore, we can acquire peace with God. We can acquire a sense of joy with God by trusting Him and believing in Him. We're no longer enemies before we were enemies. We, most of us, before we knew Christ, we didn't want to go to church. We didn't want to believe in all this stuff. But He's made us His children. He's made us a part of His family. He's given us a sense of inner peace, and he's given us a, a reconciliation of, of coming back together with him as our father. And it's interesting because we live in a troubled world today, and yet, and yet, in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the vicissitudes of life, we can still have peace and joy through Christ, no matter what the circumstances entail. And that's what Paul wants the, the church in Rome to know, and that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to know today. Amen. Amen. We've been reconciled, and secondly, we can have joy in the midst of whatever problems we go through. We've been reconciled with God through Christ, and at the same time, we can experience joy no matter what difficulties we may be going through. And I want to expound on this a little bit, but I want to define a few words, some Christian words that Paul talks about, he shows through some of his words. To the Romans. And one is justification. Because we as Christians should know what that means. We're all justified. What does justified mean? Justification has to do with the status. It's the status with God as persons that have been accepted as if we've never sinned. Billy Graham used to say this a lot. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. We're accepted by God just as if I'd never sinned. Our sins have been canceled. But it's even more than just that definition. It also has to do with God's righteousness. When he looks at us, he sees his righteousness enveloping us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Did you get that? That's, that's powerful. No longer does he look at our sins. The sins have been wiped out, as Corey Ten Boom used to say. It's been cast into a lake, and there's a sign on the lake saying, no fishing allowed. It's buried in the water. It's gone forever because of what Christ did. When he said, it is finished, when he was hanging on the cross, he said, it is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. It was done. And that's why we have justification. We have been declared innocent. Praise God. We've been restored to a relationship with God. And we now have peace with God. And we have access to God. Hallelujah. That means our prayers as Christians go through. No longer, well, I hope God will hear me. I'm praying for this. I'm praying for that. I, I hope he'll hear me. I think he will. I, I just, I don't know. No, he wants you to know that you have access to him directly. Praise the Lord. The question is not whether you pray. The question is whether your prayers go through. How many of you know your prayers go through? Hello. Praise the Lord. This is a blessed church. You know how many churches don't know that? There are so many churches in our country today. They pray. They go through the motions. But they don't really have an inner peace. They don't really know that God hears your prayers. Those prayers go right up to heaven. Amen. To God's throne room. He loves you. 
If there's anything that I'm trying to convey today is that he loves us all so much. That's why he poured out his, his love through the Holy Spirit into our hearts. That's why some of us can love, we can even, we can even love our enemies. Hello. <laughs> there are people you work with or you used to work with, couldn't stand them. Hello. <laughs> and still we're able to smile, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me move on. Second word is sanctification. Sanctification has to do with the process of purifying us. We are saved. We were saved. We're in the process of being saved. And we are going to be saved. When Christ comes back, we will be saved. We're being saved even every day. We're being going through that process of salvation. We're being cleansed. We're being purified. We're being refined. We're becoming more and more every day, every day, more and more like Christ. Amen. In baptism, when we are baptized, we die to the old self, and when we come out of the water, it's saying yes to my new life in Jesus Christ. The moment we believe in God, the moment we believe in Jesus Christ, we have, we have taken on his righteousness. It's no longer me. What is the Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Galatians 2.20. What a great verse that is. It's powerful. And it's true. And then the third word is tribulation. And I don't really have to expound on this too much because... All of us have experienced tribulations in our lives. Tribulation is trouble, hello, burdens. We've all had to deal with trials and burdens and maybe a loss of a job, maybe a physical accident, maybe some health-related situation, a loss of relationships with family members. We can all relate to that. Those are tribulations. And God allows us all to go through them. He doesn't say, well, I'll, I'll save them for, for this one. We all go through them. The one thing that we can know, though, that's so wonderful about God. You ready for this? He, he knows how much we can bear. So he doesn't allow us to experience all the tribulations that the devil wants to throw at us. So that's why we need to praise God. There are about a thousand other tribulations that the enemy would love to just throw at you and me. Amen. But this wonderful book, this wonderful book, the Bible, God's love letter, guess what? There's something like 3,000 promises in this book that we don't even know of. One, I shall keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. That's a promise. Did you know that? And then in Psalm 37, it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. There are thousands of promises in the Bible. Praise the Lord. So tribulation, we go through storms, we go through very difficult times. And we also, while I'm talking about storms, earthquakes, and things, pray for the people in Syria. And pray for the people in Turkey. We praise God. I mean, it can happen anywhere. We've had hurricanes in, in Louisiana. There, there's all kinds of things going on in the world today. Because it's not happening right here. We still, we're, we're all connected. And we need to keep those people in our prayers, wherever they may be. Everybody goes sometimes through some difficulties and storms in life. And so, this is the interesting thing, though. Paul says, and we, in verse 2, he says, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That's deep. And I want to 
get into that just for a moment. Sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Let me backtrack for a second. He's saying that the things that happen in our lives that are difficult, he said we boast about them. Why? Why do I want to talk about something that I don't like, that I'm suffering from? Because he's saying that in the midst of the suffering, God is doing something. We're not rejoicing because we're going through terrible times. We don't, we don't thank God, oh, I'm suffering. Hallelujah. No, that's not what it's about. What it's about is that Christ is with us in the midst of the turmoil that we may be going through. We're not alone. We don't have to bear that burden alone. And again, he's pouring out his love into our hearts as we're going through the valley. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We all know that. What, what, what is that from? Psalm 23. Thank you, the two of you over there. <laughs> but he says, we glory. We boast. That's what Paul is saying. We boast. The Greek word for boast is kautschomai. Kautschomai. I don't know if I said that right, but it doesn't matter. It means to boast. We glory. And tribulation, the Greek word for tribulation is thlipsis, thlipsis. And you know what that has to do with? That has to do with pressure, putting pressure on something. There was a machine back in those days that was the threshing machine that would separate, it had little spikes on it, and it separated the wheat from the tares, amen? So that they could extract the wheat, the good stuff, and then throw away the shaft, the bad stuff. That was just waste material. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's allowing us to go through a kind of threshing through difficult times. Amen? <clears throat> and he's sorting out the bad stuff. Some of us probably had tempers. Some of us probably didn't use the best language. Hello. Some of us, truth be told, we had a whole lot of bad habits when we were growing up. <clears throat> and, and, you know, me and my sister used to fight when we were kids, and now we're the best friends in the world. But when we were little kids, we, we couldn't stand each other. I mean, but God is doing, he does all these different things during our journeys in life. And he's cleansing us, he's drawing us closer to him, and he does it oftentimes through tribulation, through trials. And Paul is saying, basically, I'm not... I'm not going to put that under the shelf. I'm going to boast about my tribulations because I know that God's doing something. So let's look at this a little bit more. The threshing machine at the spikes to divide the wheat from the chaff. And through the suffering, we don't, none of us like pain. But what he's doing through it is he's building up our character. That's what he's doing. And so, years from now, our character will have improved a lot more than it was way back in the, in the 1900s, amen. Our character is building closer and closer and closer to God. Character has to do with integrity, doing what is right when nobody else is looking. You know, a lot of times we want to do good things when we know people are looking at us. But God wants us to have character and integrity when no one's looking at us. And then it leads to perseverance. Perseverance is sticking with it. Amen. And then the other word for patience is endurance. It's a continuance. It's hanging in there, not giving up. He wants us to use the, the, the things that we have gone through to build up our character. I don't know if you know the story of Ludwig von Beethoven. <coughs> Beethoven was one of the greatest composers who ever lived. And yet, as he was coming into the prime of his career, he started to lose his hearing. In fact, it got so bad, he couldn't hear anything hardly. Even when he conducted that last symphony, the Ninth Symphony, he didn't even know that 
the symphony was over. He was still conducting, and the orchestra had stopped playing. He couldn't hear anything, so he thought he was maybe 10 measures, uh, you know, behind. And somebody had to tap him on the shoulder and say, turn around, they're all giving you an applause. But one thing that Beethoven said, I want to read this because I want to get this right. He said that as he lost his hearing, he said, I will now take life by the throat. I will now take life by the throat. And it's in that spirit that he wrote his later symphonies, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth symphony. There's a sense of, I'm not going to let this defeat me. Amen. Someone who tackles the problem and triumphs over it, that's endurance. That's character. That's integrity. Hudson Taylor's wife, when she was getting older, she started to get blind. She was the wife of the great evangelist. And they said, you know, are you upset with God? I mean, look at your life. You've been serving God all these years and years and years. Well, why do you think God's letting you go through your blindness? And she said, I think the Lord is simply putting the finishing touches on me so that I can become even more like his son Jesus. That's what Paul wants all of us to do. To see it God's, from God's perspective, not our perspective. All of us go through pain and suffering. All of us are going to go through some rainfall in our lives. But God wants us to have hope. And then he says in the end, hope does not disappoint. Amen. Hope is that the Greek word, I know it's, I love different languages because it helps me get closer to an understanding. The, the Greek word is elpis. El, it's, it reminds me of Elvis, but it's with a P, elpis. It has to do with confidence. We are confident. I don't just wish that God's going to do such and such. I know God is going to deliver us. I know that God will deliver us in this particular situation. It has to do with a strong expectation, a confident expectation that God will bring us through. Our hope is in God. And then the last word is when he says God's love has been poured into our hearts. It's been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And when he pours out his love, I want you to get this. It's a divine love. It's not human love. It's divine. There's a divine love that God pours into every single one of us. Did you know that? Which gives you the ability to love even your enemies. Which gives you the ability to love a person who's been mean. Who gives you the ability through that divine love to even accept yourself and love yourself the way God loves you. He sees you as a work of noble excellence. Every single one of you. You're a masterpiece in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. You might not feel like a masterpiece, but you are a masterpiece to him because he does love you. He created, look at Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That's you. That's me. That's you, brother. That's you, nephew. That's all of us. Praise God. He has enriched your lives with his love. There's no kind of love like his divine love. Human love will, will love people because they're